hear from both speakers and then at the end of the sessions we will have in the uh, end of the session we will have questions and answers so if any questions pop up uh, in your mind while speakers are uh, doing their presentations just uh, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will um, we will look at those questions at the end of the sessions and I will put them um, to the speakers if you have a question specifically to um, to one person, just um, name that in your in your note uh, in the Q and A, and we'll make sure that that person answers uh, your question. Um, we will send a follow up email with a link to the re recorded video of the session, as well as the presentations that you will see today. Um, and I think that is all that I have to say, and I will hand over to Elsa now. Thanks, Christina. Right, I'll just bring up my slides. One second. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, right, I'm going to talk through um, from my experience um, on um, egg and ulva. Um, I obviously wasn't involved um, when egg was initially acquired because that was over 20 odd years ago now. Um, but I've been involved with several other um, recent community buyouts. Um, so this is my um, thoughts of some of the things. And we put day one of ownership, but actually I would say day one of ownership is to sit back and give yourselves time to breathe. Um, what I'm going to go through here is some of the things that you need to be thinking out in the first, thinking about in the first month or so of ownership. Not necessarily doing all of these things, but starting to pull a plan together of how you will do them. Um, so there are quite a lot of urgent things um, that you need to do in the first few days of ownership, and there are some longer-term um, actions that, as I say, it's useful to make a note of and start thinking about how you're going to achieve those. So day one, um, Callum has talked you through from the legal side, um, getting to this stage, and Dave and Rebecca from SPLF have talked to you from the funding side, getting to this stage. And I think we all appreciate that's a huge amount of work and effort um, was been, which has been put in by volunteers to get to that stage. So definitely give yourself time to breathe and congratulate yourselves for getting this far because we all know it's not easy. Um, so my presentation is going to look at practical urgent actions once you've bought an asset um, and these really apply to most sorts of assets. Lindsay is going to talk about businesses um, after I've finished um, but this would apply to um, buildings, it would apply to land, um, it would apply to any other assets that you've bought, some of the things that you need to think about immediately. Um, then I'm going to go on and talk a bit about staffing. Um, you may not have staff in place and you may be looking to appoint some. They may have been funded by the Scottish Land Fund and you've got to think about um, the sort of person that you want and the sort of skills that you need. Um, then financial management. Um, this is, I know from bitter experience, this is really difficult to catch up on. Um, so it's much better to have good procedures in place right from the outset. Um, ongoing engagement with the community, absolutely critical because after all you are a community trust. Um, thinking about the board and who is on the board, um, how you develop the skills on the board and whether you've got all the right skills um, for the board now you've acquired the asset. Um, and then recognising that most assets when you acquire them, be they land or buildings, um, they've probably been acquired with the intention of doing something with them, so improving them or extending them or building on them, so project development. So practical masters, day one. Callum may have covered some of this already, but make sure you've got the right insurance cover in place um, from um, the date your solicitor advises you have it. Um, that's going to include things like public liability insurance. Um, so if someone comes into your building or onto your land and, and slips over or falls down a hole or breaks their arm, you know, you're covered. Um, might also need to include employer's liability insurance if you've got staff. Um, you're about to appoint staff. So um, speak to the solicitor um, that you've got working for you 
you and have a discussion about the right insurance cover that you need. Um, certainly speak to other community groups with similar assets and that's where you know we at Community Land Scotland can help. Um, I know a lot of the biggest states use um, NFU um, insurance and obviously other insurance providers are available um, but um, you know it's, it's really worth just asking around about which sort of insurers that are right for your type of business and your type of asset. You should also check the property and um, so check the boundaries, make sure the fences are in place. If you bought a, an asset which has got fixtures and fittings, make sure they're all there and working um, because there's only a limited time to remedy things like that. And again, your solicitors will advise you of that, but it's worth having a good look over what it is that you've bought and just making a note of any issues so you can refer those back to the solicitor really quickly. Uh, you need to ensure that the property is safe and um, so that might be ensuring that um, if, if there are particular parts of a piece of land that are unsafe that it's properly fenced and there's proper notices um, if it's a building you know do you need to renew or change the locks or board up the windows or drain down water etc you know it's about stopping illegal entry and making sure you're not exposing yourself to any risks from third parties entering on the land um, so again that, that's all common sense um, particularly if you've, you've bought a house or bought another asset that could be obvious to you but sometimes it's the sort of things that you don't think about on day one um, you should agree who will be the key holder for the premises um, and post a notice at the premises um, following a change of ownership um, although you think everybody knows about it everybody doesn't know about it um, and if there's an issue um, it's good to know who to get in touch with um, obviously, you should let the statutory service providers know. So if you've got um, electricity um, or gas or other services, let them know about the change of ownership, take meter readings. Um, also let the council know, um, depending on what type of asset it is you've bought, um, you might have um, uh, a rates liability, um, but equally it's worth having a chat with them to see whether or not there's any period of either rates reduction or not having to pay rates whilst you're undertaking work to the property. Um, and then the last thing to check um, is compliance with grant conditions and quite often funders, particularly Scottish Land Fund, um, want to make sure that you put a, perhaps a notice up saying that this, this acquisition was funded with SLF money. If you've got other funders, they may also have requirements um, and they might also have requirements about things to do on day one that you've done these checks and to let them know. So that's the practical side of things. Then staffing. Um, some projects and when and some organisations, when you buy an asset, you might already have a member of staff in place um, that is going to manage um, this asset for you. Um, but knowing um, a lot of SLF funded projects, um, part of the SLF approval is around including revenue costs for you to appoint a member of staff. Um, so you need to sort of think about are these staff going to be operational? You know, are they going to be managing the property on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they going to be doing the rent collection and, and sorting out the services? Um, or are they project management staff? Are they employed specifically to take a particular project forward, perhaps a refurbishment project or a building project? Um, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that funders don't normally fund a member of staff to come and take minutes of board meetings and do all the things that the directors don't want to do anymore. Um, so again, it's worth thinking about what it is um, that's going to be included in that job description. Um, quite often you'll have had to agree sort of an overall job description with the funders in advance of them giving you funding. Um, once you're at the point of um, looking to recruit and advertise, review that job description because things might have changed um, look at um, other job descriptions from other trusts um, who've got similar assets or similar projects to you and see what they've included in their job description and it's really worth spending a bit of time on getting that job description right so you make sure you've got the right skills um, when you're advertising you can be really specific as to the sort of person that you're looking for and equally whoever applies for the job is really clear about what it is that you're wanting them to do um, another thing um, that's really important is agreeing who that member of staff will report to. Um, it should always be a named board member rather than just the board as a whole, um, because an individual should really take responsibility um, for that individual appointees, health and safety and personnel, things like loan, walk, uh, loan working and, and giving them support. Um, so actually taking on the responsibility of a member of staff is, is quite a big responsibility and someone needs to have their name on it. Um, so that could be the chair or it could be another board member who's got specific responsibility for HR management. Um, 
And then finally, um, both for the board, so you're clear what this member of staff are doing is going to be doing, but also the member of staff coming in is clear what they're going to be doing is agree a work plan with them for the first three, six and 12 months. So in the first three months, you know, it's, it's largely going to be them familiarising themselves with the asset or with the project and with the board, with the community and what it is that you're looking to do. And then over a longer period of time, you'd expect to be sort of identifying specific outputs that you'll be expecting them to deliver. So again, it's, it's all really common sense, um, but some of these things can quite easily get forgotten um, in the rush to, to get someone in post and get things moving. So in terms of financial management, um, I said at the outset, I've learned um, to my own cost that you should have um, a really robust system set up at the outset, even if you think your accounts are really simple um, and it might be you've acquired the asset and you're not collecting any rents and you're not going to be spending any major um, investment on the asset for a period of time. It's still worthwhile having a good system set up right from the start. Um, and unfortunately, an Excel spreadsheet generally doesn't cut it. Um, there there are lots of different options available on the market and again you know speak to other community trusts and there's things like sage or zero or quickbooks um, uh, any of those um, can be adapted um, for the type of community asset that you hold um, it's really worth appointing a treasurer to the board it, that doesn't have to be an accountant um, but again as with the staffing it's someone on the board that has specific responsibility um, for oversight of the finances you know they may be the ones that are signing the checks or, or doing the back payments together with a member of staff um, but you would be expecting them to be able to come to every board meeting and report on the current financial position um, it may well be that you don't have anybody on the board that really has the right skills to do that um, or in fact wants to do it. So do think about co-option. Um, there may well be somebody in your community that doesn't want to join the board or equally somebody out with the community that can't join the board, but really could bring the right sort of skills together to get that um, in place. Um, you should appoint accountants. If you're a new organisation, you'll need to have accountants. Um, to audit your account, um, accounts at some point. So again, have a chat with other local community trusts and see who they use. I've already mentioned about making sure that um, financial management is a standing item on every board meeting. Um, I mentioned about appointing a treasurer, so they've got oversight, but you've got to remember at all times that directors um, have responsibility for the finances of an organisation. It's not a single director's responsibility under the Companies Act and charity legislation. All directors have responsibility for the finances of that organisation. Um, and saying that you don't know, you haven't seen any financial management accounts or, or reports um, is not, it's not a good enough excuse. It's your responsibility to make sure that those are available. Um, again, it's a good idea to prepare a budget and cash flow um, quite early on in the process. And again, even if it's a relatively small asset um, with little income coming in, it's still worth doing. So you've got something to measure against at each board meeting as to, to where you are. The final couple of things to think about is, do you need to register for VAT? It may be that you don't now, um, but as you come to develop that asset, um, it will be worth registering for VAT and speak to your accountants in the first instance. And then do you need a trading subsidiary? So when you acquire the asset, it may well be that you acquire it in the charity's name, um, but then you want to um, trade from it in some form, um, in which case charity legislation requires that you can only trade up to a certain limit and then you need a trading subsidiary. It, it sounds quite complicated, but it's not. Lots and lots and lots of community trusts have trading subsidiaries. And again, come and have a quick chat with to us if you're not too sure and we can point you in the right direction. Ongoing engagement with the community. Again, you probably feel you've done this to death um, during the acquisition stage, particularly um, if you've had to run a ballot, um, but that's obviously only engagement at a point in time. Um, you must continue to let your community know what you're doing, um, engage with them on the big issues, ask them for their ideas. Um, community and awareness and engagement is absolutely essential to maintaining credibility of your, organis your organisation and reach into your community. Um, so again, quite early on in the process, um, have a chat about a community engagement plan amongst the board and with any staff you've got um, and stick to it. Um, that's partly, you know, letting everybody know it's now the community's property, um, perhaps setting up local Facebook or Twitter accounts, having a newsletter, 
obviously in these times we can't have public meetings but actually online events and meetings can be quite successful just to keep people updated as to what it is that you're doing. Uh, another area um, that some community trusts um, pursue is actually having their board meetings as open meetings. It still gives you an opportunity to have a closed meeting if there's anything particularly confidential, um, but open board meetings can be a really good way of being completely transparent and letting everybody know what's going on. And also some of the difficulties and challenges that you're facing, because those are quite often not known. Board composition and development, again, something to, to start thinking about once you've bought the asset. I think we all know about volunteer fatigue and how that sets in, especially if you've had a long, hard acquisition process. And some board members, are, you know, are in it to get to the stage of acquisition, but don't see themselves as having any long term um, involvement in the project, um, which is absolutely fair enough because you need different sets of skills prior to acquisition and, and post acquisition. Um, when you're a member of a board and particularly a chair of a board, um, I think you need to be really conscious about fatigue and, and people doing things they've never done before and lacking a bit of confidence. Um, so nurturing and supporting board colleagues as well as staff is really, really important. Um, and remembering that you're all in it together and you have to work collaboratively. That quite often you know, doesn't mean that everybody has to agree with everything. Um, and if someone really, really disagrees with the direction of the board or the organization, um, uh, then you know, the, the board is probably not the right place for them. Um, but it is quite a skill to, to bring along board members and make sure everybody feels really engaged in the process. You know, you're a volunteer if you're the chair and you're a volunteer if you're a director. So again, it's about thinking what's reasonable to ask directors to do and to contribute. Um, mentioned about needing different skills post acquisition. Um, you will have probably had to do a skills audit um, as part of any funding application you've made, but you might want to refresh that um, and think about where the gaps might be now if you're taking forward a project or if you've got um, a lack of financial support or perhaps you need HR support. Um, then you might look at sourcing new directors within the community or, as mentioned already, you might look at co-option from outside the community. Um, it's good quite early on to do um, a director's training course and um, DTAS do a really superb director's training day um, and I've done that recently um, on EGG and it was done by Zoom and it worked really well um, and it talks about what the responsibilities of directors are and issues around conflict of interest and confidentiality um, you know again which might seem like common sense but it's really good just to remind yourself of all of these things. And then finally, you know, it's good to agree the format of board meetings um, and what standing items you're going to have. So you've got a really crisp um, process around board meetings. People know what they're signing up for. They know that it's not going to on for hours on end, um, what you're going to discuss in a board meeting and what might you take offline outside it. So that's sort of something to find your way to. Um, but none of us want to attend three hour board meetings. Um, so that's really up to the chair to make sure that they're, they're pretty focused. And whilst you allow time for discussion, you know, try not to go off uh, pieced um, uh, too much. Um, another thing that you might want to look at is conflict resolution. Um, if you do have issues amongst the board or if you are having issues within the community, and I know Lindsay um, is organising a conflict resolution um, training for CLS members shortly. So keep your eyes open for that, because, again, sometimes um, having the skills in advance of conflicts arising is, is really, really helpful. Final um, issue, project development. Um, so um, most acquisitions are to support the development of new services or an improved asset. So um, it's very rarely that communities buy an asset and just continue with it exactly as it was. There'll be some reason why um, the funders have supported the acquisition about either retaining or improving or developing. Um, so again, it's really good to agree who on the board will take a lead on this and will support any project development staff. And that's not to say that they're responsible for making all the decisions, but they're there to be the conduit between the board um, and the staff or the funders. 
Uh, think about how this impacts upon your budget and cash flow. Um, so um, your, your budget and cash flow for the first year might just be around staff um, and a small amount of maintenance and insurance and services, etc. And then all of a sudden you've got a two million pound project coming into your cash flow. So have a think about how that's going to work. And that's when it's really important to have a, a treasurer on board. Um, again, do, does the board have the right skills to deliver the project? Is it worth bringing someone on with architectural skills or um, woodland skills um, or you know business skills that Lindsay's going to go on and talk about that um, to make sure that you've got the right um, oversight of the project? You know, do you need someone that's really good at fundraising? Um, we can't leave it all to the staff. Um, and project management is a skill in itself. So again, should you consider a short-term co-option to help you through this next period? Um, and the final thing is you must support your staff. I'm sure you all know this already, um, but um, staff are of very, very often working on their own. They might be the only member of staff or the only member of full-time staff, and it can be a pretty lonely position to be in, particularly um, if um, they're highly visible within the community. Um, and then once they start working on a big project, they're expected to know everything about it. So thinking about that nurturing collaborative environment is really important both for the board and for the staff. So that's where I was going to finish, Christina. I know I've covered a huge amount, but um, also that you're going to share the um, presentation, um, which hopefully has got some um, just aid memoirs in there, but very happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Elsa. Um, this has been very, in, very interesting. And um, yeah, be interesting to see what Lindsay's. Uh, presentation would add to that. Again, if anyone has questions, feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom and then we'll pick up all the questions uh, after Lindsay's presentation. Uh, Lindsay, are you are you with us? Are you there? No? I am here, yes. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my presentation as well. Hopefully you can all see that. Yes. So um, I've got a couple of hats on. Um, so I'm a development manager at Community Land Scotland, as Christina said, but um, during my time at Community Land Scotland, I've been through the whole process of a buyout and a personal perspective because um, I'm involved in um, South Kill Community Enterprises, which runs our local shop. So that was kind of an interesting journey for me to go on to see some of the and kind of real practicalities of, uh, of going through the process of buying a building, which included a going concern as a business. So I thought it might be useful for me, for me to run you through that. Uh, and I've been looking back at some of the questions that I've had from other community shops that are in the process of getting set, getting set up, because in the world of community shops, it's a bit like pass the parcel. We learned a lot from some of the existing community shops and there's a whole wave of new community shops being set up and they're contacting us to ask questions. So. There's definitely some common themes in what we get asked. So this is the shop that we were looking at buying. So um, this is the only shop in our whole area. Um, for the people who live furthest away from our nearest town, which is Dunoon, it's a 16, 16 mile drive into Dunoon to get their shopping. Um, so this uh, shop was really valued as a place to buy um, essential products, but also it's a big hub for information, like real heart of the community. And it's got a post office in it as well. Um, the, we did a community consultation about two years ago, no, three years ago now, and um, people were saying that was the number one priority for them was that they were really worried about the shop closing down. At that point, it had been on the market for four years, and Rebecca was talking this morning about when you've got the last service in a village, how important that is, and that for us was a really important thing to look at. Um, so we approached the owners and asked them if they'd be interested in going through the process of selling to the community, and they said yes they would but on the grounds that if they got a really good cash offer from someone else that they would sell to them but given it had been on the market for four years and hadn't sold we thought you know we might as well at least try and go through this process um we did a bit of further community consultation so that we could prepare a case to go to stage one of the scottish land fund and uh, one of the things that we found when we talked to the community was that people were really keen on investing in the business through community shares um, so that helped us make a decision about legal structure. So we set up a community benefit society 
we don't we did stage one of the Scottish Land Fund as, a, as an existing development trust because we wanted to raise funds through community shares we became a community benefit society uh, and in the end we raised seventy thousand pound through community shares from three hundred and fifty shareholders um, and that in itself brings some interesting dynamics because I think if you're a private business selling to community what is very different is that you're not negotiating with one person or a business you're negotiating with a whole community in their case it was a community and our shareholders so we couldn't go into discussions and just kind of come to some agreement between a few of us on the committee and the owners we had to be very aware we we're negotiating on behalf of the community and just a couple of things um, that happened to us i thought it'd be worth flagging up um, our Scottish Land Fund grant was £256,000 and we discovered that our bank had a limit of £250,000 on transactions and um, so we had to go to a second bank account which is with the co-op because um, our existing bank account with the Bank of Scotland would not allow us to have all of our Scottish Land Fund award passing through, briefly passing through our bank account. The downside to that was that the, um, our nearest co-op branch is in Glasgow which is two hours away and the co-op were insistent that they had to have someone there in, the, in their branch as the money went through. So we had to send our poor treasurer down to Glasgow and she had to spend about three hours waiting in the co-op for the money to come through from the Scottish Land Fund and then to give the go ahead for it to go back out again. So I kind of wish we'd known that a bit earlier in the process and we could have prepared for that. Um, another thing that was really helpful to us was that we got our Scottish Land Fund development officer started about a month before we took on the business uh, and she was a great help just giving us an extra pair of hands but also we were getting to the point as a committee where you know we couldn't see the wood for the trees and she was able to give us some fresh perspectives on what needed to be done um, we also because we were purchasing a going concern um, we had to get VAT registered quite early on in the process to make sure there was no VAT problems um, so our solicitor and our accountant were speaking to each other fairly regularly to give us kind of updates on what we needed, needed to do, which was massively helpful for us. We were in a slightly unusual um, situation, so Ilsa was talking about the importance of taking a breath, but that was not an option for us. So we were taking on a post office um, and the post office is trying to move people on from paying postmistresses and postmasters onto commission only agreements. But if you can run a contract with the post office that doesn't stop, so there's no day um, during the transfer that the post office doesn't open, then you can take on um, the post office on the existing conditions. So we would have gone from getting £20,000 a year from the post office to £3,000 if we'd closed down for a day. So that just meant things were a bit crazy for us and it felt a bit like this, like we were just madly rushing through the process. We didn't have time to take a breath. We, got the keys of the shop on um, about lunchtime on the 2nd of December. We closed down for the afternoon and then we reopened on the 3rd of December. And, you know, we had, we, you know, we had to learn everything we needed to know in a way on that kind of half day of where we had a chance to talk to the staff. So it was just a bit crazy. Um, so what, what did we learn that we would kind of recommend to other people? Um, I think visiting a similar community business is really important. So that can seem like a real luxury because it's a really busy time in the run up to a community buyout and you think, oh, can I take a day out to go to see another business? But we went up to see Port Appen um, Community Shop and that was just absolutely invaluable. Not only were they able to give us the need to make between being in the buyout process and actually running a business because we were, you know, you can, it's easy to forget that you're actually going to be selling beans and things when you're actually, when you're going through the process of fundraising. Um, and I remember they said to us that the chair meet, meets the shop manager every Monday morning and um, for a financial discussion and we were kind of laughing like oh, we're not going to need to do that but that's exactly what we we need to do now is that we meet um, our chair meets the shop manager every monday because it is a constantly changing business um, and so being able to get those kind of tips from other uh, similar businesses has been really important um, read the business plans of other similar businesses if you can. So I have read the New Galloway Community Shop business plan about 10 times because it's incredibly well researched and detailed. And there are so many things in that business plan that have been so useful for us. So if you can get hold of other business plans, try and do that. 
One thing we're looking at at Community Land Scotland is setting up an online library of things like feasibility studies and business plans that people can access easily. As Elsa was saying, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. It's really important that you can keep in touch with your community, even when you're really busy. Um, community bias of any sort, whether it's an estate or a shop, tend to really get the rumour mill going. Um, and so one thing that we did is we put out regular FAQs to the community. So if we heard that there was a rumour going around, we would put out a very you know, just kind of unemotional general list of FAQs, things the community might want to know. Um, people could get them up our website or we had um, copies that we're handing out to people. Um, it's just, it's, if you're being, um, if you're being challenged, sometimes it's easy to kind of try and want to hide and not give information out, but we found the best thing we could do was just giving out as much information as possible so that people knew what was happening. Uh, we got a huge amount of support with HR. I think this is one of the most daunting things for um, communities taking over businesses or assets. Um, it's that whole thing about employing your first staff, but there is a huge amount of support out there. So we got help from you know, Community Land Scotland. Um, we got some training for the business gateway because we were transferring some existing staff members to go through the TP process. Um, we got help through DTAS as well, and so we felt that we were in a really good position um, to take on that staff. Um, we, in terms of kind of ongoing HR, we found the ACAS website to be enormously helpful, and it's got lots of templates and performance that you can use, um, and so you don't have to go kind of hunting around for um, agreements um, and policies. It uh, liaises closely with the current owner, so it's really um, important that if you're taking over an existing concern that you are talking in a couple of months and then up to the buyout with the owner because you're trying to kind of aim towards that point where you're getting the seamless transition so um just one of the things that happened to us was that um on, you know day three of running our business um, our wi-fi and our telephones went dead and we couldn't figure out why and we discovered it's because we contacted bt about a month before we were due to buy the shops tell them um to send their bills to us but they previous owner had contacted BT three days after us and her contacting BT to tell them that she was leaving had cut off somehow our whole process. So we ended up in a situation which is not good as a shop to have no Wi-Fi and no telephone for about a week. So it's, you know, keeping that kind of discussion going day by day is really helpful. Don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, if there's anything you're unsure about from your solicitor from your accountant just ask away because it's it's better to um you know just ask any questions you could possibly think of and because sometimes people might have forgotten to tell you something that ends up being quite important we put together a written plan which was kind of two weeks before the day of acquisition the last few days and then what we we're going to do on day one uh, and we assigned that to different people because it becomes such a rush in that last stage that you you really need to have to know who is doing what and to be reminding people of what they're doing and it's really easy to miss out important uh, actions um, and i think as Elsa was saying just don't like don't be too hard on yourself and um, this is probably the most common thing we hear from community landowners we haven't done enough like we've not achieved everything it's also slow but people forget how much they're achieving and when they look back on what they've managed to do a couple of years down the line um, people will, have, will amaze themselves. So don't feel like you need to do absolutely everything straight away. One of the things that we discovered was like this was maybe our um, mental idea of how a shop works. Like we, I think we didn't really understand the um, how complex running a modern business is. So this was our kind of what we imagined and this is what we ended up. It was more like this when we got behind the tells and we saw under the counter, we just had no concept of how technologically complex running a modern shop is. And we're very lucky in our community. We hadn't, hadn't really thought about it beforehand, how much we'd need technological advice, but we seem to have a community full of retired IT people. And that's been invaluable because, um, you know, all your kind of ordering from your wholesalers, um, your tells, everything like that is just, is very highly technically complex these days. And if we hadn't someone, had someone who was very technically minded in a a career as an IT professional involved on the day we took the shop over, I'm not sure we'll be open yet. So the main things to think about, um, as Elsa mentioned, HR is probably the most important one. Um, if 
we had to, had to take over three existing staff and we took on three new staff. So we had to do both the transfer and recruitment process. Um, get asked a lot by other shops, how do things change on day one in terms of your relationship with the staff? And I don't think there's any a straightforward answer to that because it's it'll vary. Some uh, community businesses have got lots of volunteers, some are entirely staff based. Uh, some will have a development officer that can do a lot of the development work. For other places, it will be the board who are doing all the development work. Um, I think what's really important is just to be very aware of those dynamics. Um, you know, it's, you don't want everyone on, on your committee or board going into your community business and telling us all the kind of trying to manage the staff. It needs to be that needs to be done through one person or it's going to be stressful for the staff. So. I think in our community shop, some of our newer staff don't even know I'm on the committee. I'm just the person who goes into the shop and buys massive amounts of star bars and occasional bottle of wine. And I think that's the way that it should be, really. Um, you need to start talking quite a long way ahead with any suppliers of products you're selling so that you're ready to go. So um, most suppliers will not be used to working with charities, um, not definitely not used to working with community benefit societies. So it can take a bit longer for you to get through their systems because when they try and type your details into their computer, um, sometimes things like community benefits and sites and computer says does not compute. Um, we had to pay deposits for some, th some things like newspapers, we had to put a large deposit down with a newspaper supplier. In other places we were applying for credit, so um, we were quite successful with that and that we managed to get a lot of our suppliers to give us credit, which has helped hugely with cash flow. Basic things like utilities, insurance, Elsa was mentioning, they need to have an advance. Um, obviously, you want to transfer your utilities over um, as quickly as possible, ideal, ideally on the day. Um, council tax, technically, the solicitor of the sellers of the business should contact the local council and inform them of changes to well, non-domestic rates. We, we pay council tax and non-domestic rates because we've got a flat. We've in fact, discovered three months down the line that those solicitors hadn't done that, so it's worth checking with your local um, council that that transfer has been noted on their systems. Licenses, um, we had to get an alcohol license and there's various other requirements for running a shop. All that had to be done in advance. Um, with alcohol licenses, you've got a little bit of time to do a handover, um, but you really need to be ready to go with a lot of these things on day one. Thinking about cash flow, if you're a business that has got large amounts of transactions, you need to have some money sitting in your bank account to be able to handle all of that. So um, day one of opening our shop, we took more money in day one of opening our shop than we'd raised through an entire year of running jumble sales and coffee mornings uh, to raise funds towards the buyout. Uh, and we'd put aside about £25,000 for cash flow uh, and we definitely needed all of that £25,000. Publicity, um, it's a really good time to get a press release out, particularly to your local press, to let them know what's, what's going on. If your community supported you through the whole process, um, it's really nice to be able to tell people what are happen what's happening. Um, as I was mentioning, IT um, as well, need to get your head around what the IT requirements might be. Uh, and I think most people today have said you, you need to make the change visible. Um, so we just put up a sign outside on the day we bought the shop that says now in community ownership. That's all we needed to do, but it made a big difference um, to the community and that they could drive they could drive past the shop and they could see like all of their efforts to raise funds um, have now meant that the community the shop was in community ownership. And don't in the massive rush forget to capture a moment for the archives because you'll spend the rest of your time owning your asset, probably looking back on what you've achieved with the community. And the one thing you don't want to miss is getting a photograph on day one of everyone celebrating taking on the assets. So this is where we are now, like a year down the line, we're about to celebrate our first anniversary. You can see our shop looks a bit different and there's very visibly a community shop. And one thing that we had a plan for was um, three months after taking on the shops, a global pandemic would break out and we'd find ourselves having to feed the whole community. Um, but I think everyone says that that's been much easier to do now that we're a community shop and the whole community has kind of rallied together and helped us um, with things like getting deliveries out and running events and things. So I think everyone would, would agree that um, although there's been points on the journey that have been a bit stressful, it's been a really worthwhile um, process. So that's my quick run through. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Lindsay. Wow, there's so much. <laughs> um, amazing. Um, thanks both for, for giving us such a good overview of the things to think about before and after the purchase of a community asset. Um, we have a question for, for Lindsay. I will go with that one first. Uh, from Maria De Vatore, excuse me I, 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 if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, so thank you for sharing your first-hand experience, first, first of all. And um, uh, Maria is interested to hear how you finance the financial support and, and an accountant, how you managed to, to do that. Yeah, the accountant, um, we well, uh, unfortunately through Community Land Scotland, we had a good idea of who the good accountants were, so who, who would understand um, accounting for a community benefit society, because not all accountants would understand that. But um, a lot of the funds that we raised in the first year, um, and also through our community share offer, um, that is how we financed the accountant. Um, that is a really important thing that we needed to have money for. Um, particularly being a community benefit society, um, you know, you, it's a complex thing for the community to understand and our accountant was able to put the accounting for community benefit societies in really simple terms for people. Um, and yes, we do all volunteer as um, committee members um, and we are still super busy. I think we might be, things might be a bit calmer if we hadn't had COVID this year and we hadn't found ourselves running a whole load of additional services as well as running the shop. But in our case, our committee members are still really actively involved and in doing a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, we've got six employed members of staff, but they're all very busy. Um, We've got one part-time development officer and the rest are all working in the shop, keeping the shop running. So um, I'd say it's a great way to get to meet people in your community because everyone wants to know you if you've got control over the supply of wine, but um, it is quite a lot of work as well, but very rewarding. Um, thank you. Uh, there's also another question from Maria um, around uh, whether the, the directors are putting their time in on a voluntary basis. And also, if you want to come in uh, on this one as well to share your experience from different organizations, feel free. Uh, but I think the first, it was first addressed to, to Lindsay, if you want to go first. Yeah, and we're, we're all volunteers on our committee. Yeah, most community yes. trusts, well, all community trust boards of volunteers, if I can hear me, yeah, all community trust boards of volunteers. Um, so um, you can be paid as a director for certain types of work um, if it's within your normal course of business and all the other directors agree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can't be paid to be a director of a community board. So you'd have to be providing additional services. So generally, um, all community trust board um, directors are volunteers and don't get paid for their time. Um, and as Lindsay was saying, you know, certainly when you first start buying an asset at the, the early stages, you're really um, engaged um, and you're spending a lot of time on it. It is a great way to get to know your community and know some of the issues in your community. And I think that some of the strengths um, of that approach um, were really came to the fore during COVID because I know the business that Lindsay's involved with and lots of other community um, landowners were knew their community so well, they were able to immediately respond to what their community needed when, when the first phase of COVID hit. Um, so yeah, it's a really good way of getting to know your community, but it is unpaid. Um, and as, as community landowners organizations tend to mature and you get more staff, obviously the call on director's time does reduce and it may be that actually your involvement just goes down to the once a month board meeting where you get the papers um, and then you have the board meeting and you're expected to respond and you're taking a much more strategic role um, but I would say certainly in the early days it's a very much hands-on operational role um, where you know you can be dealing with things on a daily basis. Thank you. Um, well, um, excuse me if you hear some dogs barking in the background. <laughs> um, uh, we don't have any more questions uh, in the Q&A box, but I was wondering um, if you both could, sh could um, reflect on what if the purchase doesn't go on the 
go through on the day that it's supposed to. So we talked a lot about flexibility and this kind of takes us um, from the point before the purchase is finalized, but um, is it how common is it that things won't go according to plan, I guess, is my real question. Thank you. <laughs> Completely, you should always plan for things not going to plan. Um, because I mean, if anyone's ever bought a house, which is a relatively straightforward acquisition um, compared to a community acquisition, because it's just you and it's just a single asset and house buying goes on all the time, you'll know that there are always things that come up at the last minute um, and things never go smoothly. I mean, that, that story Lindsay tells about the bank and the co-op bank, you know, that's that sort of thing happens all the time. Um, so you have to have a really good sense of humour um, and don't get too flustered. And it comes back to the point I was trying to make. You need a really supportive and collaborative board um, that you don't need any finger pointers on the board and you don't need any blamers. Um, you just need to say, right, OK, well, we didn't know about that and it's not anybody's fault. Um, we couldn't have seen it. Um, so let's just move forward. Um, so I think that's the absolute number one takeaway from community land ownership is you never know what's going to land on your desk or on your inbox tomorrow. Lindsay, what's what's your thoughts? Yeah, I'd say the same, I think. Uh, I always used to wonder, like, why do people not do their celebration event on the day of acquisition? And two reasons. One is that the day of acquisition is often not the day that you end up expecting. It can often get delayed for a whole range of reasons. And also, you're just running around like crazy. That you, need, you need to focus on the really um, important stuff on that day. And then, you know, a month down the line or whatever, that's the time to have your big celebration. And I think that the whole fun thing is really important as well. Like we've had a few kind of um, gin and flip chart inspiration nights where we've done a lot of um, gin based um, creative thinking. And that's been really important because, you know, that the relationship between your board or your committee members is really important. And you go through some tough times together and those relationships get, can get put under stress. So it's really important that you try and have some fun in the middle of all that as well and keep those relationships strong. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're 10 minutes um, early with, um, with the session. Um, I think that uh, there aren't any more questions um, in, in the chat box. I will leave it a couple of minutes to see if anyone comes through. But I think that's just uh, because you have both given us such amazing presentations. So thank you so much. Um, OK, so while I'm giving some time to anyone to come forward with any questions. I will also just say that um, we're in, we will send a follow-up email, as I was saying, uh, in which we'll uh, include the videos from today. If you've joined us for any, um, if you joined us for more than one session and we'll share the presentations and we'll also um, share a feedback survey. So we'll be really grateful um, if you can share any thoughts or suggestions you might have um, for future events. Uh, okay, I think that that is us, unless uh, Elsa and Lindsay, you want to make any final uh, comments, any final pieces of wisdom <laughs> you might want to share. I think just um, that, you know, Elsa, Elsa's the chair, I'm the development manager at Community Land Scotland, and if people have got any questions afterwards that they didn't think of today, you know, do just get in touch with us and we'll try and answer them, that's what we're here for. Okay, that's excellent. No, absolutely. And and the thing, yeah, that I'm always impressed by is how willing other community groups are to share their experience and their learning. So there'll there'll always be somebody out there that's had a similar type of project or um, asset to you. So if you don't know who they are, then get in touch with us and we'll try and um, link you up with somebody. And as Lindsay said, they had a really couple of fantastic visits and um, at the outset of their process. And that's worth more than words, um, what you can learn, um, the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> okay, thank you both. And thanks to all our participants. Cheers. Thanks, Christina. Thank you.